All I have is Christ. Hallelujah. Jesus is my life. Great singing this morning. Incredible time of worship, I think, gets us in tune for what we're going to be looking at in the Bible this morning from John chapter 4. If you've got your Bible, turn over to John chapter 4. We're going to be continuing our series this week in no series. Uh, these first few weeks, I'm going to be kind of skipping around and just looking at different passages throughout the Scriptures as we aim towards Easter. So John chapter 4 this morning. We're in the Old Testament last week. We're in the New Testament in the Gospels this week. I don't know if you've read the Declaration of Independence lately. You probably studied it in school. You've got a few words memorized, and I can guess what a few of those words are this morning. That all men are created equal and are endowed by their Creator with certain inalienable rights. And among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Thomas Jefferson, I think, was a bit of a student of human nature and understood when he wrote those rights so many years ago that we are entitled to life, liberty, but not happiness, merely the pursuit of happiness. Happiness is something that we are chasing, and sometimes we grab a hold of it, but it's elusive, and it slips through our fingers again. I think in America in 2022, happiness has become the number one life goal. Some people want to be healthy, some people want to be talented, some people want to be wealthy, some people want to be popular, but everybody is searching for happiness. The literature on the subject has exploded in recent years, but for some reason it still seems just out of our grasp, which is ironic because you and I are among the wealthiest people ever to live on planet Earth. We have more stuff. We have more leisure, we have more entertainment, we have more freedom to do with our lives whatever we want than any people who have ever lived on this ball of rock in all of history. Yet still, we find that we are more often than not unhappy. Why is that? You can see signs of it everywhere. One particular one comes to mind from Yale University. You might have heard of Yale University. It's in Connecticut. It's part of the Ivy League. It's among the most elite of our academic institutions here in America. Only 6% of those who apply to be undergrads at Yale get in. The students there are among the most elite and privileged on planet Earth. Yet, recently in 2018, they had their most popular class ever in the history of the university. 1,200 students signed up to take the class, almost a quarter of the undergraduate student body. What was that class? It was Psychology 157, Psychology and the Good Life. The professor, Lori Santos, said that her goal in the class is to teach students how to be happy, how to be happier, and how to be more satisfied in life. And kids are signing up left and right because they don't experience the happiness they feel they should be experiencing. Or I think of uh, YouTube. I read an article recently on YouTube creators and how these YouTube creators who are running channels with millions of subscribers and getting millions and millions of views are doing the thing that they had always wanted to do, yet they find themselves profoundly unhappy. One YouTube content creator with 1.2 million subscribers said this, this is all I ever wanted. And why am I so unhappy? It doesn't make any sense because this is literally my dream and I'm so unhappy. People in our nation every day are finding out that they are getting their dream, they're achieving the thing that they want and it's not bringing them the happiness that they thought that it would. And that leads to my question this morning, which is why is happiness so hard? And I think happiness is so hard because ultimately you and I were not built for happiness. We were built for something more. We were built for purpose. You see, human beings are meaning machines. We are constantly creating meaning and infusing the world that we live in with Meaning, but ultimately you and I need a meaning. We need a purpose that is greater than ourselves. 
But yet our culture constantly tells us to look for all of our purpose and all of our meaning on the inside. Look inside yourself to figure out who you are, to figure out why you exist. But we need something outside of ourselves that is greater than ourselves. Ultimately, only the one who built us, only the one who made us, can give us the purpose and meaning that we all seek in life. And there's a problem. Our sin has separated us from the very one that we were made for. And this, I think, is why we find ourselves often profoundly unhappy or unsatisfied in life. So the answer to this problem is ultimately ending that separation between us and the one who made us, reuniting with him, and transcending the pursuit of happiness into something more. I want us to look at this from John chapter 4. There's a very interesting conversation that unfolds between Jesus and a woman that he meets at a well. Jesus and his disciples are journeying from Galilee down to, to Judea. And that journey has taken them through the land of Samaria. Jesus has intentionally mapped out their trip to pass through Samaria. And so they stop at a Samaritan town. Jesus camps outside the town at the well. The disciples go in to buy food and he is left there all by himself. And then a woman arrives. And so we're going to pick up our story in John chapter 4, verse 7. We read this. There came a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? And then John parenthetically tells us, For Jews had no dealings with Samaritans. So a little bit of a backstory here. 700 years before this, there had been two nations of God's people, a northern kingdom of Israel, a southern kingdom of Judah. That northern kingdom had been conquered and defeated by an evil empire called Assyria. They had come in, smashed Israel, taken a number of the people off into exile where they disappeared. Some of them made their way back, some different. But they had left in that land a number of God's people still living there. And they had brought in from other lands foreigners. So now you have God's people and foreigners living together. They end up intermarrying, having children and producing children who were neither direct descendants of Abraham and Israel, but also not exactly foreigners either. And so that southern kingdom of Judah, where the Jews hailed from, they looked at those who were now living in what became Samaria as half-breeds. They were neither fully God's people, nor neither fully foreigners. They were something in between. And so many of the Jews would not even eat with those who came from Samaria. They considered them to be unclean. So when Jesus, a Jewish man, addresses a Samaritan woman, Jesus is breaking and stressing all kinds of societal norms around race, ethnicity, and gender. And so she says, why are you speaking to me? And Jesus says, if you knew who was talking to you, you would be asking me for a drink of water. Verse 10, if you knew the gift of God, and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. So Jesus immediately turns the conversation back on himself. Jesus is always doing this. He's always turning attention back to him. And if you and I do that, it's a little bit narcissistic. If you're God, it's okay. And so he turns attention back to himself and says, if you knew who I was, you would be asking me for living water. And the woman says, Sir, verse 11, you have nothing to draw water with and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. So when Jesus says, I would give you living water, this woman is thinking physically. Water. The well water, it's good, but it's stagnant. It sits at the bottom of the well. The better thing than having well water is to have living water, which in our terminology we would call running water. It's water that's moving. You know that if you're out in the woods and you need a drink, you need to look for water that is moving, a flowing stream, a rushing river, something like that. You want to avoid stagnant pools of water. Why? Because in stagnant pools of water there's lots of sediment and dirt, but also parasites, bacteria, 
insects breed there, mosquitoes breed there. We want to stay away from stagnant water. Living, rushing, moving water is better for the health. And so the, the woman replies, are you greater than Jacob? Our father Jacob came to this spot. He couldn't find any living water, so he dug this well. And we've been happy to get water out from it ever since. Are you greater than Jacob that you have a source of water he didn't know anything about? I would be interested. So the woman is thinking purely in the physical sense at this moment. But of course, Jesus, as is often the case, is not speaking purely literally. He's speaking metaphorically. And he digs into this in verse 13. Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty forever. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. Now, for you and I, water is something that we use on a regular basis and we don't think anything about it. If we're thirsty, we go to a water fountain, we get a drink. We go to the fridge and we grab a drink. If we need to clean something, we use our sink. We even fill our toilet bowls with purely clean water, though I still wouldn't recommend drinking from it. But back in the day, in this time, water was a big deal. Much of life revolved around getting and using water. You'd go out to the well, you'd go out to the river, you get your supply of water for the day. And from that water, you had to do all of your cooking, your cleaning, your drinking. And so at this day and age, most people spent most of their life thirsty. There was no indoor plumbing. There wasn't even much of outdoor plumbing. Any water you had was a precious commodity. And so thirst was a regular experience. They knew thirst in a way that you and I simply do not. So when Jesus says, I can give you water, you will never be thirsty again. She is very interested. What is this magic water you speak of? And so she says, sir, give me this water, verse 15, so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. I'm really interested in this magic water. At first we were talking about living water. Now we're talking about magic water. I won't ever have to thirst. I won't ever have to come here again. So she's interested. But then we read in verse 16, Jesus said to her, Go call your husband and come here. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you are right in saying, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one you now have is not your husband. What you have said is true. Now, to be honest, if you're reading the story and if you're following the conversation, this seems to come out of left field. The woman's probably thinking, okay, I thought we were talking about water here. This just got a little personal and uncomfortable. We're talking about water source and living water, and I don't have to be thirsty, and now we're going into my private life. But why is the woman there? It's the middle of the day. If you came to draw water, you were most likely coming in the morning when it was cool, when it would be easier to carry the water back. Beginning of the day, you'd have water to use throughout your day. Why is she here in the middle of the day? Because she's ashamed of her past, of these many relationships. I don't know if any of you have ever been from a small town lived in a small town, grown up in a small town. But if you have, you know that in a small town, your business is everybody's business. Everybody knows what you did last night. Everybody knows what you did last night 10 years ago. And it shall never be forgotten. And so in this town, everybody knew that this woman had five husbands. Everybody talked about the fact that the man she was living with now was not her husband. And so she comes at the middle of the day to avoid the gossip, the stares, the judgment, the shame. And so Jesus is opening up a can of worms in this woman's life because he has something very important to share with her. And at this moment, the woman is starting to think, okay, I thought we were talking about water, but now I feel like we were talking about something else all along. And what Jesus is saying to this woman, you have been looking to satisfy your thirst in these different wells, and it's not worked. You've been looking to satisfy your thirst in the well of men and relationships, and you have moved from well to well to well, and they have left you dry, thirsty, 
and unsatisfied. The well you've been drawing from hasn't quenched your thirst. I think all of us can relate. I don't know what well you're dipping in this morning. You probably don't come in here having had five husbands. But either way, all of us have looked at some well and we have dipped our bucket in that well, hoping it would satisfy our thirst. And it did for a little while, but if we're honest, it's not quenched it. And we've had to come back again and again to that well. Some of us are dipping into the well of approval. We live for the approval of our family, the approval of our friends, the praise of our co-workers. Others of us may be dipping in a well of success. We want to be successful or seen as successful on our job, on a sports field, as a parent. Others of us are dipping in a well of pleasure, whether that's sex or food or fancy vacations or drink. Others of us may be dipping in a well of money, looking to money for our security, looking to money for our status, looking to money for possessions. Either way, if we're human beings in here, we've looked at something and we've said, that will quench my thirst, that will satisfy, that will bring me happiness. And Jesus' question for us this morning is, well, how's that working for you? It might for a little while. But long term, this woman had been going back to the same source and her thirst was not quenched. She was on man number six and she still, to quote Bono from U2, hasn't found what she's looking for. And that's the way life works, isn't it? I remember uh, when I was on a mission trip in Arizona. And I was coming back from the mission trip. It had been a very busy week. We had had so much on our schedule that I hadn't had time to go shopping to buy anything for my kids when I came back home. I couldn't come back from Arizona empty-handed. And so we're flying out, and I'm looking for something in the Arizona gift shop that I can bring back. But nothing screams, kids will like it in the Arizona gift shop in the airport until I spot this unique candy sitting there on the shelf. I actually have a picture of it right here. And an example with me. It's a scorpion sucker. And uh, one of my sons is really fascinated with, by bugs and insects and especially scorpions. And so as soon as I spot these, I thought, this is perfect. I'll take it back. The kids will love it. So I bought three of them, was flying back, and I was looking at the scorpion sucker. And I thought, that is an amazing scorpion. How did they create such a lifelike looking scorpion in this sucker? <laughs> so I started reading the ingredients in the back. Wondering what that was made of. And the ingredients literally say maltitol syrup, natural and artificial flavoring, blue one, scorpion. <laughs> That's the ingredient. Scorpion. <laughs> oh, this thing used to be alive. And they killed it and they put it in candy. Does it make any sense? So I decided to give them to the kids anyway. And so, his, and they thought it was really cool. Wow, look at these scorpion suckers. And of course, being kids, what did they want to do? They wanted to eat the scorpion sucker. So we said, sure, you know, you can take some licks on it. Just be careful. There's a dead bug in there. And so they begin licking on the suckers. I get distracted. And when I turn back around, one of our kids has licked the sucker down so far that now he's just licking the legs of the scorpion. <laughs> and so I took the, the, the sucker away and said, we're just going to take a pause on the scorpion sucker for a little while. And maybe we'll get them back out later. We haven't gotten that one back out later. See, it was enjoyable. It was tasty. It was delicious. But the more that he licked at it, eventually he found himself licking a dead, disgusting bug. And that's the things that we go after in life, the things that we think will make us happy. We lick on them. We go after them. We pursue them. We pursue that happiness. And they satisfy for a little while, but we get thirstier and thirstier, and the things that used to quench our thirst don't quench it any longer. And at the end is not satisfaction, but death. And Jesus' message is, stop dipping in that well. Stop licking that sucker, because I have a well that will never run dry. I have a spring, he says to her in verse 14. That will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. 
And so when Jesus points his finger at the woman and says, you've been dipping here, it's not been working, what does she do? She does what most of us do when the conversation gets a little too sensitive and a little too personal and a little too close to home. She changes the subject. She says, I perceive that you are a prophet. Now let's give her some credit, right? She's made some progress. At first, she's just looking for some living water, some rushing water. Now she's looking for magic water. Now she realizes, I'm speaking to someone in the know. I'm speaking to a prophet. So let's have a theological debate. Let's talk about worship. She says in verse 19, The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. She brings up the age-old debate between the Samaritans and the Jews. Age-old, which means, I guess, the last probably 700, 800 years. Where is the proper place to worship? The Jews in the tradition of the Old Testament, of King David, say that the proper place is in Jerusalem, where the Lord's temple is. That's where you must go. But going all the way back to the book of 1 Kings and Jeroboam, the Samaritans have never wanted to go to Jerusalem and worshipped. They have wanted to worship elsewhere. In fact, the Samaritans built on top of Mount Gerizim a temple where they would go to worship. In fact, Mount Gerizim was probably visible from where they stood. And so they said, we go worship on Mount Gerizim. The Jews say you have to worship in Jerusalem. And at about 130 A.D., about 160 years before this, the Jews had destroyed the temple on top of Mount Gerizim. So this was a, this was a hot topic. Where's the right place to worship, Jerusalem or Samaria? And the woman says to Jesus, what do you say, Mr. Prophet? Jesus says, okay, we can go there. Let me talk about worship. Verse 21, Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. One day this debate's going to be over. Spoiler alert, it's going to be over very soon. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship Him. God is spirit and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and truth. There's a lot there. We'll unpack what we can. What are temples for? Temples are there to facilitate the worship of God. See, there's a problem. We talked about it last week. We are sinners. God is holy. He is righteous. We are not. Sinners cannot just approach God. And so the temple is there as a means by which God's people can worship the true and living God. They do that through people that have been appointed by God who are ceremonially clean the priests who perform rituals and make sacrifices so God's people can draw near to him and worship him. That's why the temple exists in Jerusalem. That's why there was a temple on Mount Gerizim in Samaria. But Jesus says a time is coming when you will no longer need the temple. The means will no longer be needed for the end. You will be able to worship me wherever you are. Only in spirit and truth. You won't need to go to a building. You won't need a designated priest. You won't need to perform rituals. You won't need to make sacrifices. The time is coming. And it's coming very soon. When the Father is going to change the nature of worship forever. And how's he going to do it? Now Jesus doesn't fill in the blanks here. But the good news is the Gospel of John is much longer than this. And the end of the story tells us how this is going to be accomplished. This same Jesus who's speaking to this woman will go to the cross where he will die in our place for our sins. And when he declares it is finished on the cross, something's going to happen in that temple in Jerusalem. You see, in that temple in Jerusalem, there's a curtain. A very large, thick curtain curtain that separates the priests from the holy of holies where the presence of God is. Separated by a curtain. God's people, God. Curtain between them, symbolizing the way that we are walled off from his presence. But when Jesus dies on the cross and cries out, it is finished, hands, invisible unseen hands, are going to take that curtain and rip it from top to bottom because the barrier between us and our God has been erased. Christ has made the sacrifice, died for our sins in our place so that you and I can enter the presence of God and worship him. We won't need to go to a temple. 
We won't need to go to a priest. The way has been made through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And so now we worship him in spirit and in truth. God's spirit, his very presence dwells within us. What does Paul call us in 1 Corinthians chapter 6? A temple of the Holy Spirit. God's presence, that same presence that was behind the curtain in the Holy of Holies now dwells in you and me. And we worship him in that spirit and in the truth. The truth that God's son, Jesus, has come and given his life and died in our place for our sins. We worship him in his presence, through his spirit in our lives, and in the truth of the gospel that changes our lives. So that when we come here on Sunday morning, we worship. But when we go to work on Monday morning, we're worshiping yet still. Because we now worship in spirit and in truth. Jesus says to the woman, the debate is going to be over because I'm going to end it once and for all. We're not going to worship at Mount Gerizim. We're not going to worship in Jerusalem. We're going to worship anywhere and everywhere in spirit and in truth. And so the woman replies, she realizes some of what he's saying here. She connects it with what she understands from what's been taught from the Old Testament. She knows that they are awaiting this Messiah, this promised one in Deuteronomy 18, this prophet like Moses who will come and declare the word of God and perform signs and wonders. And so she says to Jesus in verse 25, I know that Messiah is coming. He who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. We're waiting for the promised one of God who's going to settle these things like you're talking about. And then Jesus makes this startling statement. Verse 26, Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. He, I'm, I'm, the, I'm the promised one of the Old Testament. I'm, I'm sent from God. In fact, later you'll learn I am God. And here's the startling thing. Here's the thing that just blows my mind. She believes it. She believes it. She just met a random stranger at the well. And she comes away saying, you know, I think that's the promised one of God. Uh, just can you imagine that for a moment in your own life for a second? Let's just say you went, to, you went to a doctor's appointment. And you go and you sit in the waiting room. And your phone, you didn't charge it. It's out of power. So you have to actually look around for something else to do for once. I know it's a horrifying thought in today's day and age, right? To have to wait without your phone to look at. But let's suppose that's the case. There's no magazines to speak of except the Sports Illustrated from 2019. And so you actually start a conversation with the guy next to you. And you talk for about 45 minutes. It's a long wait. And after that conversation is over, the nurse calls you back. And when you go back into the office, you say to the nurse, you know that guy I was talking to in the waiting room? Yeah, I think he might be God. <laughs> like what kind of encounter, what kind of conversation do you have to have with somebody that after a, a brief conversation, and we don't know how long they talk, let's say it was 45 minutes, you walk away thinking this is the promised Messiah. This is the one sent from God. This is the Son of God. And as mind-blowing as that is, let's think of it like this. The disciples who spent three straight years with Jesus, who ate with him, who walked with him, who traveled with him, who shared meals with him all day, every day for three years. Listen, I've been on long trips with a lot of people. I've never walked away from any of those thinking maybe that person was sent from God. Maybe as a test from God to test my nerves. But never that they were God in the flesh. But yet after three years, the disciples walk away from that experience saying, we walked with God. What kind of life do you have to live? What kind of person do you have to be? Tim Keller, who's a pastor, said it this way. He said, in the whole history of the world, there is only one person who not only claimed to be God himself, but also got enormous numbers of people to believe it. Only Jesus combines claims of divinity with the most beautiful life of humanity. There was just something about meeting Jesus that changes you. And, and that's what we see in the remaining part of the passage in the life of this woman. She is transformed. Verse 27, just then his disciples came back. They marveled that he was talking with a woman. Again, Jesus is breaking some norms around gender and, and ethnicity here. But no one said, what do you seek or why are you talking with her? Verse 28. So the woman left her water jar and went away into town. Don't miss the details. Why was she at the well? 
Because she needed water. Remember, life revolves around getting that water. I got to cook. I got to clean. I got to drink. I got to do everything with this water. She comes with a jar. She meets Jesus. She goes back to town. The jar is still at the well. She done forgot the whole reason she came. (laughs) Because she met Jesus. I don't know why you're here this morning. I imagine some of you are here because you've been dragged here by a parent, by a spouse. Some of you may be here because you are living up to everyone's expectations and this is where you're expected to be. Some of you may be here out of a sense of duty and obligation. Some of you may be here because you think that doing so will earn you blessing or favor from God. But let me tell you, once you get hold of Jesus, whatever reason brought you in proximity with him will pale in comparison to what happens when you meet him. You forget any of the other concerns because you have found living water. You found the well that won't run dry. You found the one thing that will quench your thirst. And that's true of this woman. She leaves the water jar behind. And where does she go? Back to town. Why was she there in the middle of the day? Remember? She was there in the middle of the day because she'd had five husbands. She was living with a man. She was embarrassed. She was ashamed. She was a source of gossip. She went there in the middle of the day to avoid people. And what did she do after she meets Jesus? She runs back to the very people that she was avoiding to say, let me tell you about Jesus. What does it say? It says, so the woman left her water jar and went away into town and said to the people, come see a man who told me all that I ever did. And you all already know about it. I see you whispering back there. Come see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? They went out of the town and were coming to him. Something about meeting Jesus changed everything for this woman. It changed her understanding of who she was. She went to that well with shame. She went to that well with guilt. She went to that well with a burden. She left that well with her shame covered. She no longer was living in fear. She didn't worry about her past because something about meeting Jesus had done something to her that the people in the town had to go see. What happened to this woman? And now they can't wait to go and meet this man either who claims to be the Christ. In fact, we read in verse 39, many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. When you meet Jesus, something happens to you. Have you had that encounter? Have you found that well that never runs dry? Have you found that drink that will quench your thirst? Have you found that love that will cover over all of your shame and guilt? Have you had an encounter that other people want to hear about. Because when you meet Jesus, when you leave the water jar behind, when he covers your past with his grace, when you meet the promised one, other people are going to want to meet him too. Many believe because of this woman's testimony, John 4, 39. How many will believe because of our testimony? Because when you get a drink of living water, other people want to know where that water fountain at. I need a drink of that too. Jesus offers a spring of water that never runs dry. In fact, it carries you not only through this life, but he tells us in John 4, 14, but it will be a spring of water welling up to eternal life. And here's the thing. In life, sometimes you're going to be happy. Things are going to go your way. More often than not, you're probably going to be unhappy when things are not going your way. But... When you have a spring that never runs dry, it won't matter. Happy, unhappy, because your thirst will be quenched. You'll have found the one that you are made for. And you'll finally be able to transcend the pursuit of happiness into something even greater. The pursuit of joy and purpose and life. In Jesus. And you'll be like the psalmist in Psalm 1, who says that in the Lord you are like a tree planted by streams of water, and you will yield your fruit in season, in happiness, and out of season, in unhappiness. But you got to stop drinking out of the well you're drinking out of and drink out of His. When my son, my oldest son, turned one year old, 
We threw a big birthday celebration for him and invited all of our friends and family to it. And the highlight of the celebration was when we were going to present him with his birthday cake. At this point in his life, he had never really had sweets. You know, you just don't usually stuff your six-month-old with candy. And so we had been waiting for this moment to give him something truly delicious. At this point in his life, the most exciting snack he had ever had were these things called puffs. Some of you remember puffs. It's like a dried cereal fruit-flavored food. And so the moment arrives, we sit him in his high chair, everybody gathers around, we sing happy birthday, the cake comes out, we plop it in front of him, his candle's burning, he blows it out with some help, and now we just know he's going to dig in, he's going to smash his face in it, he's going to shovel it in his mouth, but instead, he didn't want to eat it. In fact, when we encourage him to eat it, he flat refuses to eat it. And everybody has gathered around, so we want to make sure he eats some cake. So we cut it into smaller pieces. Maybe it's, it's too big. So we cut it into smaller pieces, give it to him. Still, he doesn't want to eat the cake. So then we get strategic. We go and get his puffs. We put some puffs on the tray. We break the cake into little pieces, mix it up with the puffs, hoping that he would pick up a puff with some cake on it, eat the cake and the puff, and discover what you and I already know. Cake is delicious. <laughs> but instead, he picked up that puff, Dusted the cake off and popped it in his mouth. Going his whole birthday having never eaten a bite of cake. And you and I do the exact same thing. The God of the universe who made you, who saved you, who's coming back for you, is standing there saying, I am living water. Come quench your thirst in me. But we're saying, no, Jesus I've got this well over here, and I know eventually it's going to satisfy. And he's shaking his head and saying, I have a spring that will well up to eternal life. The question for you and me is, will we drink of it? Let's bow our heads, close our eyes, go to the Lord in a word of prayer. With heads bowed and eyes closed this morning, I just want to ask you this question. Have you experienced the living water that Christ offers? Have you trusted in Jesus as your Lord and Savior? If this morning you have not done that, that you can do that. The Bible says that anyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Right now from your heart to God's heart, you could say, Lord, I believe what you've done through me, for me through Jesus Christ, and I want to trust you. Come into my life, save me of my sins. Right now you can pray to him and he will be happy to come into your life and offer you that forgiveness. Maybe you're here this morning and you say, you know what, Brian, I've I've trusted in Jesus Christ, but I have been drinking from all the wrong wells. They don't satisfy like they used to. Or I've been hopping from well to well. And I need to come to the living water. He's inviting. The invitation is here. Father, I thank you this morning. I thank you that in a world pursuing happiness, we know that we could pursue something even greater than that. The living water that you offer. And so my prayer, Lord, is that whatever wells we're dipping from, wherever else we're looking, that today you would fix our eyes on Jesus and that we would come to him and find a well that will never run dry and find satisfaction that will last not only through this life, but through all eternity. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you now to stand as we respond together in song and prayer and in worship to our God.